Welcome to the Backyard Bouquet Podcast, where stories bloom from local flower fields and home gardens. I'm your host, Jennifer Galizia of The Flowering Farmhouse. I'm a backyard gardener turned flower farmer located in Hood River, Oregon. Join us for heartfelt journeys shared by flower farmers and backyard gardeners. Each episode is like a vibrant garden, cultivating wisdom and joy through flowers. From growing your own backyard garden to supporting your local flower farmer, the Backyard Bouquet is your fertile ground for heartwarming tales and expert cut flower growing advice. All right, flower friends, grab your gardening gloves, garden snips, or your favorite vase because it's time to let your backyard bloom. Today on the Backyard Bouquet, we have the pleasure of welcoming a true garden guru and passionate advocate for beautiful, bountiful gardens, Stephanie Bittner. Stephanie is a visionary owner of Homestead Design Collective, a renowned landscape design firm nestled in the vibrant San Francisco Bay Area. With a mission to craft gardens that not only dazzle the eye, but also delight the palate, Stephanie and her team at Homestead Design Collective have been at the forefront of creating stunning outdoor spaces that offer bounty and beauty. Throughout their unique approach, they seamlessly blend organic farming principles with fine gardening techniques to bring life to aesthetically designed organic and edible gardens. Stephanie is also a published author, having co-authored several best-selling books, including The Beautiful Edible Garden, and harvest unexpected projects using 47 extraordinary garden plants. And now this week, she is also the published author of The Fragrant Flower Garden. She continues to inspire gardeners around the world. At Homestead Design Collective, Stephanie's passion for sustainability shines through in every project, from replacing traditional lawns with water-wise native scapes to weaving bee-friendly wildflowers into the landscape. Her designs not only conserve water, but also celebrate the seasonal splendor of nature. With a portfolio that includes prestigious projects such as the Test Gardens for Sunset Magazine and the chef-focused edible gardens for Robert Mondavi and Prisoner Wineries, Stephanie's work has been featured in numerous publications including Vogue, Sunset Magazine, and Food and Wine. Today, Stephanie joins us to share her wealth of knowledge and insights on creating beautiful, productive gardens that nourish both body and soul. So sit back and relax and prepare to be inspired as we delve into the world of garden design with the remarkable Stephanie Bittner. Welcome. Thank you, Um, Jennifer. That was an amazing introduction. Thank you so much. It is such a pleasure to have you on the podcast today. I know our listeners are going to gain so much from you and I know that I am also going to learn so much wisdom from chatting with you. So I'm excited for this conversation. So let's dig right in. And I know I told a little bit about your background in the introduction, but would you mind telling us a little bit more about who you are, what you do, and where you're located? Sure. Um, So I'm the owner of Homestead Design Collective, um, and we are about 15 employees. We, um, we design, we, um, we install, and then we organically maintain, um, gardens, um, throughout the Bay area. Um, and also I will say, um, we do design work throughout the country and also recently designed a regenerative farm in Italy. So wow. we do projects, th- you know, throughout the world now, which is super exciting. Um, we are probably best known for designing the gardens for Sunset Magazine in Sonoma. Um, but we also do, you know, our bread and butter is really helping folks in their residential home gardens. Um, and they really kind of go, you know, from the deep South Bay all the way up to Napa. So they are very diverse in terms of climate, um, sun exposure and, and size. You know, we have, we have gardens, like I have a little garden in Rockridge, which is, Um, a community that's um, part of the Berkeley community, so small, urban. And there's only room for one raised bed in the front yard because that's where the sun was, and that's what we did. Um, So we're used to really working with folks, you know, where they are, and then really helping them to embrace organic gardening practices and creating really beautiful landscapes that also give back through harvest. 
I love that. Where in Italy did you design a garden? We designed a garden in Tuscany. Um, kind of an amazing story. Um, it kind of my first book, The Beautiful Edible Garden, is a book that is kind of that, that did very well and is available, you know, almost Barnes and Nobles and such. And um, and so the daughter of my client is a well-renowned surgeon, and she happened to be in Los Angeles, and she went into a bookstore and picked up my book, found me on Instagram. The power of Instagram. It boggles my mind, the power of Instagram. That's how I found you um, too. Um, it's amazing. Like, and she um, she DM'd us, and um, we started the process pre COVID. And during COVID, we um, we designed the. Her family owns a bed and breakfast. When agritourism is very big in Europe, and um, and they wanted um, to really bring the more regenerative principles of farming to their bed and breakfast um, through actually creating edible garden space. And so we designed an orchard. We designed um, a huge edible garden that had tons of um, perennial edibles that could be used as crops, but also were screening plants and also shrubs and structure plants. And um, and then, um, yeah, we after went as soon as um, we were able to travel, my team and I, um, which includes Christian Cobbs, who's our lead designer, and Peter Elliott, who's our project manager, um, the three of us flew to Italy for two weeks, right when the country opened back up, and um, and really spent a long time. The first week, just walking the property. The property is about forty acres, and finding all of the native plants so that we can bring them into our design. And um, cyclamen is native to Italy and grows wild. Which I mean, I think for U.S. growers, they're like cyclamen. You know, like what you get at the big box stores. It's a wildflower there. Um, oregano's, thymes, all those plants just grow organically. Marjoram, you just you're on a walk and you can actually start harvesting for the kitchen, which is incredible. And so yeah, so we spent a lot of time. And then recently, uh, we have another project now in Puglia, Italy. So amazing. Wow. Yeah. I lived in Italy in 2004. So Italy will always oh. have a little piece of my heart. Well, we'll have to talk again about Italian gardens sometime. Absolutely. Uh, I, um, I'm really, I'm getting to know a lot of the farmers right now in Puglia. And um, I, a lot of folks are really excited about flower farming. So I think that there's this really great tie over the excitement of flower farming that's happening in the U.S., and I will say probably through the power of Instagram, the word is getting out. And, um, and so the, a lot of the farmers I was meeting with, there was a lot of focus on um, on flowers as well as crops. Although they go hand in hand, because in order to grow food, you have to grow flowers. Absolutely. Bring in the pollinators. I, I think flowers are definitely having their time in the spotlight right now. And I think it's only going to grow. And you're right. Instagram is a huge launch pad for a lot of people where I think they're seeing what's potent, what's possible. And they're saying, I want to do that as well. You have been doing this for a while. How did you get your start in landscape and garden design? It has been a while. Um, um, well, honestly, my mom was a gardener. And um, growing up in the Bay Area, we have a climate where you can you can grow year round. And um, I remember my parents um, would like plant competing tomato plants when I was a kid to see which who would do best. My mom was growing things organically. My dad was throwing I don't know stuff. Just he would throw st probably Miracle Grow. I don't know what he was throwing on there. Um, we quickly convinced him to stop because my mother's tomatoes were so much better. So I always kind of had a background in gardening, and um, but really embraced it um, when my children were young and I took time off from work. I spent a lot of time growing our own food and really kind of reconnecting with the garden. And um, and sadly, my father was diagnosed with a terminal cancer during this time, mm -hmm. and I really really focused on growing food. And, um, and after he passed, um, I kind of had this epiphany of like, life is short and you need to do what you want to do. I mean, he was 63 when he passed. So, um, so I decided to not go back to work in an office, but went to our local community college and started taking some landscape design classes and then was quickly hired by a well-known landscape designer here in the Bay area. To, and, I had run into him as luck happens and he, and I told him what I was doing and he was like, start edible landscaping for me. And I was like, okay. 
And um, during that, he had a nursery. I um, started teaching um, food classes, so how to grow, how to grow your own food-based gardens. And um, one of my students ended up being the managing um, um, editor at Ten Speed Press, who was my publisher. So you know, I really believe in luck. I, I believe you have to have a lot of hard work so you can take advantage when luck appears. But um, but I had a series of events where I was starting my own business, which my first business was called Star Apple Edible Gardens, and also then had a book deal in hand my first year of business, which was really like lucky. That's incredible. I was I was always taught that luck is a matter of opportunity meeting preparation. That's you said it much better than me. And yes, I I fully agree. Even when the opportunity came to design the gardens for Sunset Magazine, um, I had done a bunch of work with them. Um, we had designed some demonstration gardens for them in the past. When we got the call of asking if we would be interested in designing it, um, of course you say yes, right? You don't have. I mean, there wasn't like a a moment I wasn't going to say yes. But um, it was a project that happened really fast. And we really had my whole team, we had to pivot on what we were doing. But because we were, you know, we just, we were well organized, we had been working really hard, our ability to pivot was um, easier, I think, than it would have been for most folks. And, um, and so, yeah, and I spent a couple of years really focused on that garden and um, helping to get the word out through the magazine about what you can do um, in terms of growing food, natural dye plants, flowers, um, and such. So, Well, I'm really sorry for the loss of your father. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It, um, it's been a long time now. Um, and I hope this doesn't, I hope if, if people have experienced loss, I hope that they understand where this is coming from. It's taken me 18 years to be able to say this, but um, in so many ways, his um, his passing was like the greatest like um, gift in my life because it really, I mean, I would do anything to have my dad alive. Let's just be very clear. But I mean, but his passing really motivated me to make changes in my life, and I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't be doing this if it hadn't been for that key key moment. So I think it's those hard times in life that really make us step back and examine and realize our time here is so short. And we ask ourselves, am I doing something that I really enjoy? And does it bring me joy? And does it benefit those around me? I think there's probably people listening today who have either experienced the loss of a loved one or they've recently lost a job or in a position like I was when I started flower farming where I had a young child at home and I was paying a fortune in child care and trying to find ways that I could make a living doing something that allowed me to yeah. be present. And I think that it's those life changes that open our eyes. So if someone was listening today that's in one of those times of life and they have a yard or a garden or a space available to them where they could get started, and we this is a cut flower podcast, so whether right. they're growing cut flowers to bring themselves joy or they're interested in growing cut flowers to turn it into a business, what suggestions and advice would you give to them to get started? Sure. Well, I think really understanding the property that you're going to be growing on is probably the most important thing. I think both of us turned our passions into professions. And I think um, I think there's a lot that kind of comes hand in hand with that. Um, but I think really understanding where you're going to grow. So do you have um, access to water? Are you are you zoned for residential? Are you zoned for farm? That's a really important where we are in California because I live in a drought state. And water is one of our most important resources and extremely expensive if you do not have a well. Or basically, if you are zoned for residential water and you don't have a well, um, thinking that you're going to grow dahlias and, and sell them is a fool's game, in my opinion, because um, the amount of water that you will spend on growing those flowers, you will not be able to recoup your costs. So it's, so it's also, then it's like, well, what type of lower water flowers can I grow where I'm using less water and I can get, you know, I can get, you know, 
prime dollar for these plants. So, you know, my in our world, that would really be the protea family, things like leucodendrons, proteas. There's a whole world of low, celosia so is a low water cut flower. There's a whole world of low water plants that make beautiful arrangements. And then of course you can have one or two beds of dahlias that you water super efficiently to then, you know, be your focals. But if you just think that you're going to, that you have a residential plot, again, this is in California where we're in a drought, um, and just plant a quarter acre of dahlias throughout your backyard, your bill, your water bill is going to be three to $5,000 a month. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Like it, it will, it's shocking to people. So I think, I think that's the kind of the hard thing. And I, I see this a lot. A lot of my clients have watched the Florette documentary series. They call me and, um, and they're like, I want to grow flowers everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I, and so, and I also have some clients who are florists as well. And so really what we do is, and again, this isn't about, so I'm pivoting. I'm going to go back to answering, how do you have your own business? But really, um, if you, if you want to be a florist, have your own piece, have, you have your own flowers coming in. It's really more about um, what can you grow in your garden that is having double duty. So they are still a screening plant from your neighbor. They're still a foundation plant for your house. They're low water. They're perennial. They're low maintenance and fast growers. That's really important if you're going to be cutting from them and then creating really water efficient space for your annuals and understanding um, how much water they're taking and how you can water them efficiently. I think there are so many jobs um, and I hire people all the time that are kind of coming to this of people that want to change their life and get involved in, in the world of flowers and growing food. Um, I think anytime you can get hands-on experience is the most important thing and get your hands in the dirt to see if you really like it. Absolutely. Um, gardening is so different than what you see on Instagram. And I think it's really um, shocking for folks, like how much heavy lifting you need to do. So I think that would be the first thing. And then I will say the community college system throughout our country is one of the best resources for changing a job. So, you know, just taking a horticulture class, taking a class on irrigation. I, you cannot go into this if you don't understand how to irrigate your plants because um, hand watering is not an option. You Like hand watering a, a flower farm or even a backyard will take hours and hours every week that you don't have if you're a small business owner. So understanding irrigation. And then um, I think every small business owner needs to take a class on QuickBooks and understand how to pay themselves. Because as much as we love what we do and the passion that we bring to it, if we don't know how to monetize it, then you are just going to be spinning your wheels. And the first thing you have to do is understand how to how to actually invoice and bill for your services. That is such a great point. I think that's what really differentiates someone between a cut flower gardener and a cut flower farmer is do they have a yeah. way to monetize it and make a profit? You just touched on so many wonderful points, and I have a whole list of questions now from what you just said. <laughs> talking about water being an issue in California, yeah. and I don't think it's just California anymore. I'm here in Oregon. We normally get a ton of rain, and I think you guys have gotten more rain than us this year. We are in a deficit, and I run on what's called a farmer's irrigation district, and when our water is short, they don't even start our season on time or they can lessen the amount of water we get because it's all based on what they have on reserve. So I have a feeling that the water issue is going to become a very prominent discussion for people wanting to grow. And I think one of the first places that I'd like to touch on with you because of what you do for a living and helping people design their gardens I think the American idea of a grass lawn is quickly oh changing. And I think that's opening up a lot of opportunity for people to grow cut flowers. How do you see the impact of the water shortage and grass lawns changing? So I would encourage everyone to really reevaluate their lawn. Now there's obviously all different types of lawns. Um, there are some beautiful native no mow lawns that people install with wildflowers. I mean, we're not talking about those. We're talking traditional grass that you're playing soccer on, you know, things like that that take a huge amount of water and space and often chem chemicals. 
that space can be repurposed to be really beautiful and productive and um, including plants that you can cut for the vase, plants that you can use in the kitchen, and also to make natural scent as well. Like we, I do a lot of natural scent projects. So the first thing you're going to want to do is convert your um, your whole garden care to organic care because you do not want your family to eat pesticides and you don't want to grow something that you're going to turn into a salve or a flower mist and that you don't want to be putting pesticides in your body because you will also ingest them through your skin. In terms of how to how to visualize, and I think that's the hardest thing people have, to, is that they just think of the American dream and that lawn in front of the house. And I think starting to just visualize that that space can have it can have multiple trees, it can have shrubs and perennials. Um, I do think the front yard is a space to have more evergreen plants. Again, I'm talking about um, folks that aren't under snow all the time. Um, I live in Minneapolis for a, a period of my time of my life. And um, so it's a very, you know, I'm not, you're not so worried about evergreen plant material because everything's losing its leaves. In terms of, you know, like the lower part of the states um, where we do have evergreen material, I think the front yard is a place to have it. Um, when you pull up to your front door, you want to not be stressed out by what you're looking at. And if you have just rows and rows of crops in your front yard, you're going to, you're working all day and you're picking up the kids from school and you're, you're going to feel the tug of like, I need to make sure it's neat and tidy. And and so that is, so we design, if people do want to do, and I do cut flower gardens and edible gardens in the front yard, but we design it with a ton of structure. So no matter what the annual crops look like, the garden looks beautiful. And then the annual crops can kind of go up and down. You know, I also think that the front yard is the place to have um, a lot of your pollinator attracting plants. We need the pollinators for growing food, obviously for flowers. The great thing is that like fragrant plants, the whole reason why they're fragrant is not for us. It's to attract the pollinators. And so um, really making sure that you have a succession planting of blooms. So you have plants that are blooming in spring, summer, fall. If you if you are able to grow in the winter, winter blooming plants as well, that's going to support your local pollinators and really help to build a healthier ecosystem in your, in your neighborhood, which is really important. Um, but also means that you will have a continuous supply of flowers for your vase and for your home, which is important. That is great advice. What I'm laughing as I'm listening because when we moved into our house, I knew I wanted to grow flowers. I didn't know at the time I was going to become a flower farmer. And we have this weird triangular shape in our front yard, and I didn't want to put in grass. And I guess I should say in the very front yard leading up to our front door, we have this square patch and it's not huge. It's probably maybe 10 by 20 feet. And I thought, well, I'm going to start growing all my annuals here. And I planted a whole bunch of cosmos and zinnias and I planted them in rows. And it wasn't really enough to be a flower farmer, but it was enough to make some bouquets and really learn what I was doing. But my husband hated it because it didn't have the curb appeal of- right being appealing to everyone else. And then when I dug them up in the wintertime, we just had this big muddy mess. So you mentioned having structure. And earlier yeah. you talked about things like screen plants and foundation plants. Those are new terms to me. Can you elaborate on that for me, please? Sure. So um, if you think of just a traditional front, let's just talk the front yard. It'll make it easier. Perfect. When you look at your house, the, the basics of what your house needs to be framed and softened is usually we do a focal front yard tree. Um, most folks have some type of tree in their front yard. What's really great is that that tree can um, doesn't have to be some ubiquitous street tree. It can actually be a tree that provi provides harvest either through food or flowers or both, to be honest. It should be both, in my opinion. Um, and then you need some foundation plants. And the foundation plants are the plants that are up against your house. And it softens the edges. It hides a gutter. It softens the you know, the base where the house meets the ground. And usually that's, that's a combination of, of smaller trees and shrubs. 
Um, and then kind of coming out further, um, they're screening plants. So oftentimes, like, what if your neighbor has a really ugly fence, but you can't do anything about it? You want it to disappear. You can put screening plants, right? So that's, you know, when we design a space, we're looking at, like, what are what is your need, right? Do you have screening needs? Do you, uh, is, is your house properly supported with foundation plantings? Do you have room for a focal front, front yard tree? Do you have a room for two focal point front yard trees? Um, how do you enter your space? Um, you know, like, is it a straight walk to your front door? Is it a meandering path? If it's a meandering path, there's really opportunities to have like smaller trees, like we can grow citrus here in the Bay, but it can be other things that are smaller that you can interact with. Um, as you're walking up to your front door, um, a lot of people will put tree roses in very traditional houses. And I'm going to make the argument that that is not a great choice just because anything with thorns on a pathway can reach out and grab you. So I like to put the thornier things a little further away from the pathway, but that's how we start. That's how we start in terms of um, designing a space is are, are those elements. And, um, and in the book, we I actually list like my favorite um, focals, foundations, screenings to help people start really thinking of plants um, as being dual purpose. So they're giving you a landscape, they're filling a landscape need, but you can still harvest from them um, for those things. Now, Wait, I'm sorry, say, which, which one of your books is that in? I, I okay, that's in beautiful edible for edibles, but fragrant um, for the fragrant flower garden. Um, I also have that in there as awesome. well. So we have focal points, destinations, um, anchor plants, um, and then um, I do. I talk a lot about night fragrance because I personally love night fragrance. Um, ground covers, low growing plants. Every plant in your garden can actually be fragrant. Um, and, um, and so then just thinking about how, um, how you place them, um, understanding also fragrance, um, you don't want to have, um, something that has a very strong fragrance. Like we call that a, a heady fragrance, um, right next to something else has a really strong fragrance because they're going to compete. So, you know, there's a whole, uh, the, the book kind of delves into that and how to, how to do a succession of, um, of scents. So, um, like let's say lilacs. I have a soft spot for lilacs. Love lilacs. Um, yeah, right? I mean, they're just, it's such a short period of time, um, but it's so glorious. And, but you can, you know, the lilacs, in my opinion, are, um, they're, they're not a beautiful shrub when they're not in flower. So that's not something that I would put front and center. I'd have it as more of a backdrop. Um, but when they're in bloom, you want to make sure that you don't have something right next to them that's also in bloom because the scent from that lilac is going to fill the entire neighborhood, right? If you have your window open, you're going to smell it in your house. You're going to pick them. I will say what's cool about about lilacs though, is that there are so many varieties that there are early, mid and late varieties. So if you have something you really love, you can extend the harvest. So I actually, in my garden, I have an early variety and I have a late variety. Um, so when the, when the early variety is totally done, a, tup, a couple of weeks later, the late variety begins. Um, so if you, ha so, you know, a lot of people think of succession planting in terms of farming, like with annuals, right? So every month you're, you're, you're sowing so many cosmos or so many um, of whatever you're growing, right? So make sure that you have a constant supply. Right. I think of this in terms of food growing, like you want to make sure you have salad, you know, every month, you, every, so every month you have to plant salad. Um, with your perennial shrubs, you can actually, and trees and perennial plants, you can take the same concept, just understanding when their bloom time is, and you can map it out so that you can make sure that you have something that's always in bloom in your garden. So oh, we talk about that as well. That's great advice. So. Do you have a favorite lilac? Yeah. I mean, well, I'm kind of a lilac floozy. So really any and all. Um, I really love White Angel, which it was my mom's favorite. So I have just, um, I have a very emotive reason to, en to enjoy it. And I will say, and now that I'm sitting here saying that out loud, a lot of my favorite fragrant plants are based upon memories and emotions. I remember the scent of my grandmother's scented geraniums. Like scented geraniums, I think should be in everyone's garden. They are low maintenance, 
they're low water here. They can totally be ignored and you can, they can be the filler of your bouquets. You can make tea with them. You can make natural scent projects with them. They're beautiful and you can ignore them, right? You can't ignore dahlias. You right. can't ignore cobbles. But having some plants that are, um, that kind of thrive on neglect are the key to not wearing yourself out. So, uh, you know, so I think of like, I think of the the white angel because my mother had that in her garden, which then I inherited. So I have that, I have her lilacs. I, I live with her lilacs. Um, I think of scented geraniums as well. I think of the fragrance of strawberries mm. a lot. That tends to be one of my favorite scents because I, my grandmother um, always made a strawberry jam as a kid. But um, so, you know, definitely it depends upon what fragrances you love. It's funny. Um, I have a lot of clients who want peonies and where you live, oh my gosh, Pacific Northwest, you all can grow all the peonies. It's incredible. And um, and I mentioned in Minnesota, in Minnesota, they can grow all the peonies. Um, we can't in the Bay. Well, that's not true. We can, but I would make the argument we shouldn't because they take so much effort to grow. Um, and so much water, but there are peonies that we can grow here that um, are not as hard. And um, but some of them smell horrible, like oh. cat urine. Like, <laughs> like, so, like there are certain plants where, like, I like there are peonies that smell so good, and you want to fill your house with them. But some varieties actually smell horrible. And if something smells horrible in your garden, it's going to smell horrible in your house. And it's going to smell horrible in the bouquet that you're you're selling. So it's really important to know, like, you know, almost like I, I recommend to people sometimes that they go to either like a botanical garden or like in Oregon and Portland, you have the most amazing public rose garden um, or even like a really good nursery and um, and actually go and smell varieties before you buy them. Because there are many plants that look so beautiful, but the reality of their scent is not so great. And, and you know, that's totally fine for a landscape and a garden. But if you're actually coveting that plant in terms of its ability to be in a bouquet that's in the house, you want to... Um, you just want to kind of smell test it. That is great advice. I'm thinking about bearded iris. I love bearded iris. And I absolutely love the smell in the garden. But when they start to go bad in a bouquet or in the vase, the smell yeah. is really pungent. So I don't typically use them. I will use them for event work, but I don't use them for day-to-day -day bouquets because most people don't know that you can pick off one flower to allow for the next one to open up. But that smell out in the garden, I just love the scent. And it, for me, it brings back going to Shriners Irish Guard, Iris Gardens with my grandmother as a child. And I, it was my mom, my grandma, and I would go together. And it just brings that memory back for me, which you touched on and mentioned how fragrance generates and helps us remember those memories Gardens in general, like to me, should just be an extension of our living space, and it sh and and gardens are really meant to be lived in. I don't, I don't, you know, I we create really beautiful gardens, but but to me, a garden is not successful if you're not out there, you're not touching the plants, you're not smelling the plants, you're not eating the plants, you're not if you like to talk to the plants, whatever it is, you know, that you're eating outside, you're living outside. You know, your gardens should can totally support your lifestyle and um and that of your families. And for me, fragrance is such a big part of that. And um, and what's really cool is that plants are also fragrant at different times of the day. Oh. So you have things things that are fragrant in the morning, things that are fragrant in the afternoon, things that are only fragrant in the evening and at night. So you can actually have an experience in one day where you actually are inter interacting with plants and smelling plants. It's like it changes throughout your day, which I think is very exciting. Can you give us um, an example of plants that have scents at different times of day? I was not aware of that. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, so when a plant is... Um, when a plant is fragrant is when it is ready to be pollinated. So it, you have to think about what's pollinating these plants. So plants that are pollinated by moths and bats, and I'm going to get my list from the book so I can read it to you, and um, um, are, are fragrant at night. So 
some of my favorites. So the night blooming plants, there are things like, um, so there's night blooming jasmine, which I, love- I mean, oh my God. Jasmine, one <laughs> like, of my favorite scents. Yes. And, but there's, there's a specific variety that only is, is fragrant at night. So if you love jasmine, you actually can grow multiple jasmines so that you have the jasmine fragrance in during the day. And then also at night, um, there's flowering tobacco, Nicotiana. Um, I love Nicotiana, um, cause it's a super tough plant, but it also grows in partial shade and shade. And uh, most folks have you know, sun and shade parts of their garden and they want production for flowers in the shade. And then the Kishiana is a great one for that. So the the fragrance of the Kishiana during the day is really almost non-existent. And then in the evening, it starts to let it out, which is really great. And there are, there's actually a jasmine scented Nikishiana, um that is like off the charts in terms of fragrance. Do you know which that is? Um, it's actually called the jasmine. The variety oh. is jasmine scented. It's so great when that happens. I love a grower who names things um, so literally. Yes. <laughs> but, uh, but um, and then there's also things like four o'clocks. You know, four o'clocks are, are definitely our mo- more old fashioned um, annual. It, it is a an annual that reseeds easily. So you have to know if you're adding four o'clocks to your garden, it's a you have you now have a lifetime relationship with them because they're going to keep going. Um, select seeds this year. Um, I, although I think they might have introduced it last year. There's a new um, four o'clocks to me. I'm not saying it's new to the world, but new to me. Uh, it's called Fairy Trumpet, and it is the most stunning four o'clock I've ever seen, and is so vase worthy, um, and so incredibly beautiful. Um, I love four o'clocks because they actually open up around four or five o'clock in the day. So if you're doing like, we've done a lot of sensory gardens for families with little kids and it's really cool for them to be able to go out in the garden and see that as everything else is going to sleep in the garden, this one particular plant actually begins to open up. And, um, and that's when you smell it is in the evening and at night. So it's a really fun one to, um, to have in the garden. If you're doing lots of night walks, as well. Like I really love to do night walks in my garden. Um, So I try to get the night scented plants to be more towards like where I have a landscape light so I can find them (laughs) without a flashlight, to be honest, Um, or obviously a window. I mean, having night blooming things by a window is really great. Um, We have a plant called Brigmantia or Angel's Trumpet that we can grow down in our zones. And that's one that we really love if someone has a hot tub to actually plant it like in the background of a hot tub because you take you go in your hot tubs in the evening and at night, and that plant is such an incredible night fragrance plant. So um, kind of thinking about how you're using your garden, again, like where, where how are you using your garden at night? And then you can strategically place some night blooming plants as well. I love those suggestions. That's something that as I am relocating our farm and redesigning, I'm trying to be more intentional about how things are laid out because I have had the benefit of planting in long farm style rows, but as I'm pivoting and using our yard space more than I have in the past, I'm trying to be very intentional about how I interplant things. And I'm really thinking about the scents and how I can use them beyond just the bouquet. You've mentioned hand salves and teas and different things. Can you tell me what are some of the other uses? Because you can also farm flowers or grow flowers for the hand salves or medicinal purposes. What are some of your favorite methods that you like to grow flowers for? So I love a multi-purpose plant. That's kind of what all my books have been about is, you know, plants that, um, that again, are providing you a landscape duty, but also you can harvest from. So um, I actually, for our clients, I grow a lot of tea-based plants, which are all fragrant. Um, and I like to do tea bouquets. So this is something that um, I do a lot of tea and medicinal bouquets, to be honest. Um, so the tea bouquet is the idea of that is it's all plants that actually taste good together oh. in a pot of tea. So we will harvest 
what would be the equivalent of everything that would go into one pot of tea, and then we'll we'll twine it up, and our clients will actually enjoy it in the vase for a few days, and then they can take it out, cut the bottoms off, hang it up from the twine, and let it dry. Or they could, of course, just put it directly into a teapot if they'd like. But um, having having bouquets that also have multi-purpose is super exciting to me. Likewise with medicinals, so many great medicinal plants are also obviously um, are also very, very fragrant. You should know what the fragrance is because not every fragrant is good to everybody, of course. But in the book, we actually did. Um, we did a perfume stick project. So basically, I'll bet, take a step back. With so the book is about um, how to how to design a fragrant garden, what the plants are that are some of our favorites for the garden, and then how to arrange with fragrance because I also think that's important um, in terms of seasonal blooms and having um, scents that actually go well together and don't clash, and then also then how to preserve natural scent. So when you preserve scent, you're extracting the fragrance from the plant. Right. So you can do that through infusion. You can infuse it into a neutral oil or you can actually remove it with water, like through um, distilling. So hydrosols, okay. um, which is like very common. And I actually teach folks, of course, if you have a copper still, like amazing, that's a big that's a big commitment. They're usually about five hundred dollars, like starting off. Wow. Um, if you have a still, you can make high, like so many hydrosols, like the world is your oyster. But um, I teach folks in the book actually how to do the distilling process with just simple pots, like the, just on your kitchen top, how to do small ba- small batch distilling as well. Um, when you do that, you're really not going to get much essential oil. The essential oil is really going to go back into the hydrosol. Um, a common name for hydrosol is also flower water. Um, and that's, you know, we use hydrosols for like face toners as a natural um, aromatherapy for a room or like a room freshener. You can use hydrosols for so many things. You can add it to witch hazel and make it a toner. There's just, there's lots of projects that you can do with them. So, but we also, you, when you um, infuse an oil, then you have this incredible oil that can be used for many things. And one of the things that I like to do is make perfume sticks. It's a super easy thing to do with kids. We just get the simple like craft push-ups. They kind of remind me of like the push-up sticks that we had as kids. Well, I'm older than you. We had push-up ice cream. I as remember kids. those. Like, okay, so it's the same concept, but it's for um, perfume. And you push them up from the bottom. It's fair. They're very inexpensive. You can get them at a craft store. I also in the book tell you where you can get them online. But you take your your infused oil, and um, and then you add beeswax. And then um, we got a little fancy with this one because um, we had um, we, my co author had a broken eyeshadow, and was like let's add this. And um, so she took her broken eyeshadow and it added, added a shimmer to the, um, to the perfume stick, which she has a little, she has a, a young daughter. So really fun with little kids to have sparkles and perfume, but there's, you know, but once you have your oil, you can do a lot of things. You can make a lip gloss, you can make a perfume stick. Um, I also really like hair oils personally. Um, they're, you know, working in gardens all day is can be really hard on your hair. So um, we have, um, a, we have a Jasmine hair oil oh. as well. It's a jasmine citrus hair oil project. Um, do you sell so that? That's kind of, I don't, these are all like how to do it yourself. Oh, so inside so, the book, people can learn how to do each of these projects themselves with the flowers they grow. It's all small batch. So it's really meant, you know, if you're a flower farmer and you have large batches, of course, you can double and triple, but really this is the, it's really meant for someone who has, you know, a small garden harvest and how can you preserve the scent of your garden harvest? I love that. People that have been listening to the podcast for a while know that I have mentioned several times that one of my goals this year is to figure out how to bottle up the scent of daffodils. Oh, not hard. I would use Enfleurage. What is that? So Enfleurage is a, um, it's a ancient French technique of extracting the, um, the scent of plants, um, onto a base. Now, ancient times they used, um, animal lard. We don't do that. 
Um, we use, typically I use coconut oil, just simple um, refracted organic. Um, and I actually will use like with the solid, you, what you do is you lay um, and there's instructions on the book. So I'm just going to do the quick down and dirty, but there's detailed instructions in the book. And obviously online you can find um, methods as well, but um but you lay the plant material on the on the solid and you cover it and you let it sit for a day or two, you remove it and then you add it again. And what you're doing is you're infusing the scent into that, that solid. Now there's a fast way to, that's the slow way. And then that base of that coconut oil um, then becomes the base as like a hard perfume. And what's really great if you use coconut oil is that it's super moisturizing. So like if you're going to do like a perfume balm like that and use it on your elbows, you can put it on your skin. You could, If you use coconut oil, you can actually cook with it if you wanted to. I don't know if I'd want to cook with the scent of daffodils, to be honest. Probably but like, not. <laughs> yeah, probably not. But lilac. Yeah. You definitely would cook with the scent of lilac, right? So there's so it's um it's really good. Now there's a fast way to do enfilage, which is melting the, the oil, the base into actually a liquid oil, and then in then putting the flowers into that oil. Um, it's a much faster process, and it really depends upon what you have growing in your in your garden. So if you have one big harvest, you might want to do the liquid. Because it's not, you don't have like enough to do seven to 10 days worth. But let's say you're growing your, these, the scented narcissus, and you know, you have one plant that is ready to be harvested. Um, but then you use that. And then the next day, the next plant is ready. It's a much more, um, the more traditional route is much more about the small batch. And also, um, it's kind of more a little realistic because most people don't have, you know, bundles and bundles of something that's also like with distilling like to truly get essential oils you have to have enough from a flower farm right you have to have hundreds of something to get the essential oil which is why i kind of focus on the hydrosol because you can have just a bundle of something and get a flower water so it's just kind of taking the ideas of the big farms and how to like translate it into how you can do it with a you know a harvest coming out of a garden I love that. And I think so many of our listeners have the smaller scale cut flower gardens or cut flower farms. So your tips and advice for doing it and instructions will be more practical for what most people are able to do. Definitely. And you mentioned before about restarting your farm. And um, right now in the farming world, like talking about regenerative farming is something that's on top of everyone's mind. What I think is really beautiful about regenerative farming is that it's take you know in many the way that the way that I see it the way I interpret it um, is in many ways it's introducing the garden back into farming. Yes. So, so you're you know you're bringing back in perennials, you're bringing back shade plants, you're really you're getting away from the mono the monocrop you know point of view, and you're building a whole ecosystem. And I think that's really beautiful. A lot of what I've done in my work is taking the best of farming and introducing it into gardening, right? So how can we get productivity out of gardens in a way that the farmers do? So I think it's really exciting right now that farmers are really embracing how can we add the more perennial aspects of gardening into our farms. So it's just kind of this beautiful marriage, I think, that's happening between the two worlds. Yes. Thank you for touching on that, the regenerative flower farming is definitely in the spotlight right now. And I think a lot of people are wanting to transition to that because it is a more sustainable method and it's more practical in the small scale spaces. I think for many of us, I mean, I would love to say that we've bought a new farm, but farmland is expensive and it's not readily available, especially for a flower farm where I am, we have lots of orchards, but not a lot of vacant farmland. So as I'm hunting, I'm thinking, well, how can I small scale grow flowers and do it in a way that is beneficial to the environment around me and creating an ecosystem that brings in the wildlife and is not disruptive of nature? Well, including trees and shrubs. Yes. I think what's really great 
is when we get away from this idea of um, of just this monocrop, right? So all I'm going to do is grow this one thing and harvest it to the ground. When we start to end, and by the way, I think when florists go to the flower mart and they buy those big bundles of one flower, a lot of times they only need two or three for their bouquets and then the rest are thrown away. There's so much waste in the floral industry. So much waste. Yeah. So much waste. And so I really think for the flower farmers and really for the for the florists who are really getting back into you know, doing their own, you know, growing their own flowers is that you only need one or two stems of something. And especially if the flower farmers are making their own bouquets, what's really exciting is, is that those trees and those shrubs that are providing that perennial aspect and also habitat for birds and pollinators um, also can be aspects of your bouquet. So we were talking about lilacs earlier. I think lilac, the foliage and the branches of lilac is beautiful as a filler when it doesn't have flowers on it. And all you need is one piece, right? So if you, again, if you're doing this more of a small scale, you can go out onto your land. Let's say, let's say you do have a flower farm and you're planting some, maybe some hedgerows, right? Hedgerows are fantastic um, for, for bringing in the birds and the bees and, and creating windbreaks um, and so many things, but you can plant things in your hedgerow that you can, you can harvest as branches that you can harvest as your foliage. So just thinking about the fact that just because the plant is providing shade, it doesn't mean that you can't always harvest from it. It does mean that you cannot harvest it to the ground. You can't treat perennial plants that way. But if you are getting away from this idea of, you know, bundles of 25 to sell, but instead you're doing these more bespoke kind of bouquets and arrangements, you can have pieces of all of these things um, in your bouquets. And they also provide you with those things year round, which is pretty great. That's a great suggestion. For people listening, what are some of those hedgerow plants that you would suggest that can serve as a habitat for the wildlife, but also provide filler and greenery for their bouquets? Well, this time of year, I think, and it's not fragrant, so, uh, so I apologize, but um, this time of year, I just think of flowering quince, mm. right? It's, it's so great. And flowering quince needs actually some space. Um, they tend to kind of thicket if they aren't cut all the time. Um, and a thicketing is fine for a hedgerow, to be honest, but um, but you have to cut them really hard, which is great for, for what you want from them. Also, like I would say the berries, so thornless blackberries, thornless blackberries are beautiful in bouquets. They're great for, for also for the birds, but um, make sure you're planting thornless so that you're being easy on yourself because why plant thorned blackberries if you can have thornless? If you're using them for bouquets, it, that means you don't have to strip the thorns for your bouquets, um, but you can use the flowers when they're unripe are so beautiful in bouquets. I really love that look, but also the flowers. Obviously, you can also harvest the fruit for yourself, make some ice cream, make all kinds of stuff. Um, and then I do think that's the place, like hedgerows um, are the place to let some of the really, um, well, climbing roses, like the wild roses, but I would also say like the Ragosa rose. Um, the Ragosa rose is um, a really hearty, hearty rose. It gets drought tolerant. It can handle like seawater. It can handle, you know, they can handle anything. And um, they're fin it's actually the best rose for rose hips for tea. Also the rose hips are so beautiful in those in the fall and winter bouquets. Uh, but they also spread really quickly. So again, if you have the space for a hedgerow, I would probably do some Ragosa roses. And then I probably would do some like some of the crazier vines that just need space, like honeysuckle. I love honeysuckle. I struggle with where to put honeysuckle in gardens. You know, it has to be like a back fence in a garden um, where it can just take over and hopefully not knock the fence over because it's such a thug. Like <laughs> honeysuckle's a thug. And, um, and so you really need to give it a space where it can be wild. And, um, and a hedgerow is a, is a place where you could probably just let it go wild as well. Thank you for those tips. Elderflower, elderberry, sorry. You, everybody should grow elderberry. Mine so. is huge. I actually need to prune mine back okay. this year. What type are you growing? Oh, 
I don't know. What color is the foliage? Is it green, blue, or black? It's black. Okay. You're doing the black lace. Yes. I love black lace. Thank you. It is black lace. I have all of my, when I buy plants from the nursery, I save the tags and I have them in a bucket that I'm embarrassed to say. I'm not even sure where the bucket is. I know I still have it because I don't get rid of my tags, but. There's also so many, um, I used to be really like, oh, there's no way those work, but actually I, lately I just tried one and it totally does. There's so many apps now that take a photo of your plant and can help you ID them, Yes, which is really helpful. But I think if you have a farm or a larger garden, I, um, elderberry is such a great plant to include. Again, one of those tough as nails, likes to be ignored, totally supports the birds and the pollinators. But the, the foliage of the elderberry in a bouquet is so beautiful as filler. And then, of course, the berries are medicinal and wonderful. And then the flowers, like you can make cocktails and all kinds of stuff. I have not ventured into that. I'm hoping that maybe my downsizing (laughs) this year might allow me a little bit of time to experiment with some of the edible flowers. I will send you a copy of Harvest because a lot of what my second book is about is how to do those projects with the edible plants, like the perennial edible plants. I think I did a honey infusion with elderflower, but um, but elderflower um, is also the basis of incredible cocktails. If someone, if you do drink cocktails, but also it's incredibly medicinal. Elderberry is one of the really great medicinal plants. So also toxic, by the way, it's incredibly medicinal, but toxic if you eat the wrong parts. So again, know your plants, know what you're doing. Do not eat the foliage of elderberry or the bark because it will give you a tummy ache. That is good to know. I think that's something we also have to be mindful about is knowing what's safe to plant, especially if you have pets or children. For example, I was soaking my sweet pea seeds this morning and one fell on the floor and I was quickly scrambling to find the seed before one of the dogs had a chance to get it. So it Good to know what is safe and not safe. Does your book cover that also? It does. I talk about food safety in all of my books. Um, Some of it is, you know, talks about soil health, Uh, you know, especially when it comes to growing food-based plants. um, You really want to test your soil, not only for nutrition, because if you're knowing what to put into your soil, but also to see if you have exposure to heavy metals, specifically lead. Most, Most gardens that are, that surround an old house typically have lead in the first two feet around the house um, because of lead paint. Like it's just, we old houses used to have lead paint. So that's just where you don't want to grow something that you're going to ingest either on your skin or in your, you know, by eating it, but great for an ornamental plant. You can still grow things there. And then also exposures via pets, of course. And then, um, you definitely don't want to grow food or grow flowers where your pets are using the bathroom, to be really frank. Yes. There's pathogens and all of that. Speaking of pets, I think my dog just barked. Um, and and then also in terms of food safety, um, I really love that every plant in the garden can be useful. And that includes ground covers and low growing plants. But um, I, if if you're planting plants like in between pavers, which is a beautiful look, I put cre- creeping thyme in between pavers all the time. Um, sorry, time and time. Um, but um, but I do not harvest the plant that is where my foot my foot steps on it for the kitchen. I allow it just to flower for the pollinators and do its own thing, and I. I harvest the plants for the kitchen that are on the side planting beds because the reality is, is also the bottom of our shoes tend to have a lot of really gross things that we don't want to eat. That is a good point. I interplant Corsican mint throughout all my stepping stones. Of Corsican mint. Oh, do you ever do Blue Star Star Creeper? I don't know that one. So look it up. Blue Star Creeper. Would come, but, well, Corsican mint, when it's happy, just takes over. Mm-hmm. It's another one of those garden thugs. But um, the Blue Star Creeper, it has little white blue flowers that look like stars. Oh. And it's also a shade ground cover, just like the Corsican mint. So you can combine them. So you can get like a more floral aspect, but you then get the fragrance of the Corsican mint. 
I'm writing so, that down. I'm going to have to add in. I, mine hasn't fully filled in yet, but it, it's one of those memories for me. I remember my mom had it as a ground cover when I was a little kid. I remember rubbing my hand and then I could be out in the garden right. smelling it. And I've showed my daughter. And so now we'll, we'll go rub our hands when our hands are all dirty with dirt and smelling and have a good scent on our hands. That's awesome. Yes. Wow. We have covered so much. And I feel like we have only scratched the surface today. You are such a wealth of knowledge that I know both our flower farm listeners, as well as our cut flower garden listeners will be just gleaming so much from today. I know I've taken so many notes chatting with you and I've had a chance to peek at your new book, The Fragrant Garden or excuse me, The Fragrant Flower Garden. And I'm so anxious to now check out your other two books as well. Before we part today, do you have any last advice that you would like to share with our listeners today? That's a big question. Um, but yeah, I think I, I think it's very much in line with your philosophy as well, Jennifer. I, I think bringing common sense to your gardening and to your farming practices um, in terms of just if something feels right going forward with it, but, but definitely, you know, doing things that make sense, like wearing closed toe shoes, like we, we have discussed our love of closed toe shoes in the garden, um, but really embracing what you love. I think we both have been really lucky to take things that we're passionate about and turning them into careers. And, um, and I think that really following your heart, it's really hard work. I mean, there, there are probably both of us really like don't sleep much and are up at the crack of dawn, but there's something about working with plants and, um, and being outside and really following your passion. That's very fulfilling in life. And so I'd really recommend that folks really embrace their love of plants and flowers and just see where it takes them. That is great advice. Thank you for that. I know people are going to want to look you up and learn more about you and your landscape design business and your books. Can you please tell us how can our listeners find you? Sure. Um, so my company is Homestead Design Collective. We're on Instagram, um, Pinterest, um, and if there's anything else I should be on, please tell me. Um, but we, but Instagram by far is is probably the best place to find us in terms of seeing behind the scenes of what we do. Um, and of course, we have an old fashioned website. Um, so it's just www.homesteaddesigncollective.com. Perfect. And your books, where are your books available? They're available everywhere. Um, definitely, um, they're you know they're available at all the big box stores. The all the big guys, but I also encourage you to, to shop at your local bookstore. There's also um, an online, um, I think it's called Indie Shop, where um, you can buy my books and then they actually fulfill the orders through your local bookstore. Highly recommend that folks do that. But of course, Amazon has them and, um, and definitely in the spring, you know, they're usually have a good discount on them because they're promoting garden books. Um, so you can find them anywhere. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. I am just out of curiosity. Do you have a book tour or anything coming up? Um, so I um I I am going to be speaking at a couple of places. Um so um I'll be in Seattle, but I think that's going to happen before this comes out for the Northwest Flower and Garden Show, but definitely keep your eyes out for next year. The Northwest Flower and Garden Show in Seattle is really our greatest garden show on the West Coast and has so much great information. Um, I'm going to be speaking in Pennsylvania in May um, at a big garden symposium. And then I'll be doing events throughout the Bay Area um, this spring. And so if you're in the Bay Area, definitely keep an eye out on the Instagram. I'm, I'm going to be partnering with Morning Sun Herb Farm and Soul Food Farm to do some garden and also some flower arranging classes. So, Oh, I love it. Well, I have family in the Bay Area. Maybe I'll have to time one of my trips with one of your classes. You. That would be awesome. I would love to. Um, and uh, I mean, there's so many incredible flower farmers in the Bay Area. Um, I mentioned Alexis from Soul Food Farm. We're doing a we're do an event there. There, people are doing some really cool work down here. So it'd be fun for you to to meet some folks. I would love that. 
Well, Stephanie, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing such insightful advice with all of us. I would love to continue this conversation another time with you and invite you back on in the future to share even more gardening wisdom with us if you would be so willing. Oh, I would love it anytime. I love talking gardening with you. Anytime. It's the best. Well, thank you so much and happy gardening and we'll talk again soon. Thank you, flower friends, for joining us on another episode of The Backyard Bouquet. I hope you've enjoyed the inspiring stories and valuable gardening insights we've shared today. Whether you're cultivating your own backyard blooms or supporting your local flower farmer, you're contributing to the local flower movement, and we're so happy to have you growing with us. If you'd like to stay connected and continue this blossoming journey with local flowers, don't forget to subscribe to The Backyard Bouquet podcast. I'd be so grateful if you would take a moment to leave us a review of this episode. And finally, please share this episode with your garden friends. Until next time, keep growing, keep blooming, and remember that every bouquet starts right here in the backyard. This is Jennifer Galizia of The Backyard Bouquet, signing off to head back outside to tend to my garden. Mm -hmm.